Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to our service this morning. First song will be number 687. 687. Of yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Of yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up. And he Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. And He died for us. And He died for us. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. And He saves our souls. And He saves our souls. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to Stroudsville Church of Christ. I'd like to especially welcome our visitors. We want you to know that you're our honored guest. If you are visiting with us, we ask that you please uh, fill out an attendance card from the pew in front of you, and you can put that in collection plate on your way out or hand it to one of our ushers. I'd like to remind everyone of our scheduled services. Our Sunday morning worship begins at 1030, and our Sunday evening worship is at 6 p.m. We have a few new uh, safety guidelines are in place to ensure proper social distancing and for serving of the communion. We ask that you be considerate of others and join us uh, via live stream or Facebook if, or on YouTube if uh, you're not feeling well. There will be a Bible Bowl practice this afternoon at 4.30 in the large classroom in the education wing. The quarterly men's business meeting is today at 5 p.m. in the fellowship hall. All men in the congregation are welcome and encouraged to attend. Social distancing, distancing will be maintained along with uh, wearing masks, and all three elders are available to be present for this meeting. Memorial Boulevard Church of Christ is hosting a gospel meeting July 19th through the 24th. A flyer is posted on, on the bulletin board for, with more information. Reminder that our Wednesday night uh, ladies class meets each week at 7 p.m. through uh, Zoom. Please see Meg Payne for more, inf more details and information and the, the link to attend. There will be a teens, uh, girls, cake decorating class, Devo, and lunch on Saturday, July 25th from 10 to 12 in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, please wear a mask. Gloves will be provided. For more information on this, you can see Michelle Mikowski or Meg Payne. You are invited uh, to a baby shower for Ryan and Miranda Morris on Sunday, July 26th from 2 to 4 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Ryan's the grandson of Genevieve Hutchison. Uh, they are expecting a little girl. They're registered at Amazon, Target, and Bye Bye Baby. Please see the bulletin board for RSVP information. There's a bridal table a shower for Alexis Wallace and Matthew Hensley set up in the foyer. Please uh, bring your gifts by August 2nd. They are registered at Target, Walmart, and Bed Bath and & Beyond. And our final announcement, Hillcrest will be hosting their annual uh, youth rally on Saturday, August 1st, with Lonnie Jones as the uh, key speaker. There is a flyer on the youth board with more information. If you'd like to attend this, uh, please let me know, and I'll get you more information. That concludes our announcements. We'll now have a reading. A weeks ago, I did a communion meditation that referenced Habakkuk 1 and 2. I won't read both chapters this morning, but I think it's important for us to hear the message that God gives to Habakkuk in a time where it's chaotic, um, and we feel like it's chaotic, to remember who's in control. 
It's not social media, people on social media. It's not our president. It's our God. So it's Habakkuk 1, 2, 3, 5. It says, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surrender, surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. The Lord's answer. Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. Song for opening prayer be number 522. 522. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. I am bound for the promised land. I'm bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. O'er oh, all oh, those wide extended plains shines one eternal day. There God the sun forever rain and scatters night away. I am bound for the promised land. I'm bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. When shall I reach that happy place and be forever blessed? When shall I see the Father's face and in His bosom rest? I am bound for the promised land. I'm bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. I have one announcement before we do our opening prayer. Uh, just for safety purposes, at the end of services, uh, we're going to dismiss by a row so the ushers will help you. We'll start at the, the back as you go out the building after services. Uh, if you'd like to, to talk to someone, uh, you can either do that outside or spread out in the hallways or the fellowship hall or somewhere where we, we can have more spacing. It's just a little tight. Uh, in the foyer there, but that's just a protective thing. Uh, we don't want to be like some churches. They've had uh, positive COVID tests, and then they've had to go back to live stream. So we appreciate your attendance here, and we're just doing this as a, a protective thing uh, for everybody. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Help us to love our enemies, and we pray for those who may be causing problems and strife in our lives. Help them to deal with their difficulties and to look to thee for guidance. Help us to react in a loving way so that by our example they may turn to thee. We pray for those who are physically sick and for those who are shut-ins and for those who may be here today or listening by live stream but with significant afflictions. And we also pray for those in our families, our friends, and our co-workers who are sick. 
If it be thy will, heal them and help them to overcome their afflictions. Be with the families of those who have died. Please comfort them in their sorrow. While physical health is important, help us to have greater fear for our spiritual health and the spiritual health of others. Help us to reach out to the lost in our families, our communities, and the world. We especially pray for our children and grandchildren. Help us to regularly study the Bible with them. We pray for those children who are participating in Bible Bowl. Encourage them to study thy word and become closer to thee. As a church, please help us to develop ways of reaching our children through the Bible, through electronic means or providing a safe environment to have Bible class. Please be with those in our congregation who are serving in the military. We pray that they would help, that they would be safe. In today's world, with less respect for your message as stated in the Bible, we pray that our local, state, and national leaders will not impose laws that will prevent us from following your will. Help these leaders to use their authority to allow Christians to lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Help us to be peacemakers and to raise up leaders who will both punish the evildoer and bring peace to others. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. To prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 166. 166, we'll sing verse 2. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on the tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected. Bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified, freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. As we come to our, this part of our worship, in which we remember the Lord's death until he comes again. When we look into the scriptures, the scriptures tell us that Jesus wanted to have a fervent last meeting with his disciples on that Passover. He had some things that he wanted to discuss with them. And the, one of the important things was the fact that he instituted uh, the Lord's Supper, of which we uh, find ourselves a part of today. When we think about what was taking place, we find that Jesus, uh, as he talked to those, uh, those disciples, the apostles, that he says, I want to institute a, a new thing. And that new thing was the fact that he wanted to institute a, a plan whereby he would be remembered till he comes again. And so today as we uh, surround our table and as we think about the things that God has done for us, the things that Jesus did for us, then uh, he says, I want you to do it in a worthy manner, 
as Paul in instructed the Corinthians to do. And as a result, uh, we remember his body uh, by the bread that we will uh, consume. And we remember his sacrifice of blood as we uh, drink of the fruit of the vine. And so at this point in time, uh, shall we bow for prayer as we give thanks for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we give our thanks for this bread, which is representative of the, the body that was willingly went to the cross. And there Jesus gave his life and, and shed his blood for us. And so he willingly went there and sacrificed his body that we might remember at this time the suffering that he endured for our you know, on our behalf. We pray, Father, that you would bless us as we partake of this bread. And, Father, help us to remember that it represents the body of our Lord. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue this memorial feast, we give our thanks for the fruit of the vine, which is representative of the blood that was shed in our behalf. Father, we pray that you would be with us as we partake of this Lord's Supper, as we remember the blood that was shed on the cross, the agony and the pain and the, the suffering that our Savior endured, that he might give us the opportunity of being a part of his kingdom. Father, bless us as we partake. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. As you leave today, you will have an opportunity to uh, lay by in store as God has prospered. And so at this time, we, we offer our thanks for the blessings that God has given us. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings of life. We thank you, Father, for the, the ability to make a living for our families. We pray, Father, that you would Continue to help us to always remember uh, you and your kingdom. And Father, it's as we lay by in store that we show our love for, for you and for those out in the world that we're trying to reach. Father, we pray that you would bless us as we give. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to mark your song books or song invitation after the lesson, be number 558. 558. Before the lesson, stand and sing number 643. 643. I heard no, no story. Our safe came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary. To save a wretch like me, I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory!
Good morning. It's great to see everyone here today. I appreciate your presence. I know it's kind of yucky having to worship in a mask. Amen. But, you know, nonetheless, we understand for the benefit of all of us and the protection of those around us, we, uh, we wear the mask even though we don't like the mask. It's one of those necessary evils. And I just want to say thank you to our elders for struggling with these difficult, difficult decisions during COVID. You know, what's the right thing to do? Where's the balance? Um, who do you listen to? I don't know about y'all, but watching the news makes me kind of depressed. I've gotten to the point where I just like, no, I don't want to watch the news anymore. If I hear COVID, I'm going to get sick. Not literally sick, but sick of hearing COVID. But it's, uh, it's just one of those things we deal with. It's uh, part of being human. We're starting a lesson series, and I hope that you're enjoying it so far, but we're talking about the idea of sharing our faith with other people, evangelism, and Jesus told the, the disciples in the beginning of his ministry in Matthew 4, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. We know most of those apostles he chose were fishermen. They knew how to fish, how to catch fish in nets. They weren't sure how to catch men. But they did. They learned. They watched Jesus. Uh, they taught the gospel. They learned to share Jesus, and we need to learn to share Jesus. How do, how do we share Jesus without fear? How do we realize that this is not a suggestion that the Lord makes, that you share the good news of Jesus? It's not a recommendation. It's a command. We're commanded to go and preach the gospel. I told uh, the congregation last week that if we believe God wants precious souls to accept him, and I'm going to stop there and say he does, it's a, it's a requirement. We, we have to get out there and share that good news. We have to also believe that there's an opposing force, that is Satan, who wants to prevent us getting out and sharing the good news. 
Do you believe that? Do you really? I mean, you got to ask yourself, are there opposing forces here at work? One, to take the good news of salvation to a lost world and to share it without being ashamed, without fear of being intimidated, to be inconvenienced for the sake of sharing the gospel, and then you have those who want to shut the gospel down. I uh, was watching a movie that I'd seen several times. I saw it again, God's Not Dead. And it was interesting, at the end of the movie, it, in the credits rolls all of the, the um, legal cases that are taking out in universities in the United States that are shutting down the free speech of Christianity on campus. What does that tell me? It tells me, brothers and sisters, that there's opposing forces out there. There's a war going on against the spread of Jesus Christ. If you have good news, then you have enemies of the good news who want to shut it down. Now, you can call it witnessing, testifying, sharing your faith, letting your light shine, or evangelizing. I don't really care what you call it. What I do care is, are you doing it? Are you sharing the good news of Jesus? So I've taken the acrostic evangelism. Last week, we looked at the first letter, E, everywhere, talked about getting it out and how we get it out, what's the way of broadcasting that good news. Today, V is going to stand for victory, and I appreciate so much Brian leading that song that I'd requested on victory. There is victory in Jesus. And so think about it this way. If we know there's opposing forces, good and evil, God's team is out there sharing the good news of Jesus, the redemption through his blood. We sing songs like victory in Jesus. Then there is opposing forces. And so that's why there's a victory, because there is a battle. I want to just stress um, this last Line, and I'd like you to sing it with me if you've got that up in the graphic. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Now we're going to talk about two things. What is the victory and what is the cleansing flood? How are we plunged between the cleansing flood? Victory over what? So my mind, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of, of like... I don't know if y'all went to the very first Star Wars movie. I went back in 77. You see, I'm old. But that's when episode four came out. Remember the very first? It was an amazing movie. But what stood out in my mind in Star Wars was the those who created this movie had this ability to show powerful forces on both sides, right? And we know that Darth Vader was on which side? The dark side, right? And those who had lightsabers and were Jedi Knights were on the good side. They were called, may the force be with you. Remember, help me Obi-Wan Kenobi, your mama. It's a great storyline. But anyway, the point is, in Star Wars, which you haven't heard of that. I'm sorry about your accident in the coma, right? But in Star Wars, this idea is consistent through every episode of good versus evil, right? Both very powerful forces. And the question left in the mind of the, of the person who watches this story unfold is which side is going to win? One side seems to be more powerful than the other, but they're fighting back and forth. And so in the church today, are we really fighting a war? All right, that's the question I'm asking you. Are we really fighting a war? And will we be victorious? Is there victory? Victory over what? Exactly who is the enemy Here in Christianity. Now you may recall that a few months ago, back before COVID really got cranked up, I think it might have been in the end of 19, or I don't remember, it's all running together. But we studied a lesson series on Wednesday night on the book of Revelation. Does that sound familiar? We studied a book by Brother Eldridge Eccles, quite a scholar, and it's called Haven't You Heard There's a War Going On? Now on the next slide, you'll notice that word war is capitalized. War. There's a war, Brother Tom, really, in Christianity and in our faith and in defending the the message of Christ and getting out there and sharing the gospel. There's a war. I'm going to say unequivocally and without any shame, yes, we are at war. And if you're not sure there's a war going on, then maybe Satan has crept in and somehow diluted your thinking or caused you to think everything's just fine. Now, I'm going to take you back to Revelation. In the first few chapters, you remember there were seven churches that were addressed, right? The seven churches of Asia Minor. The one at Laodicea, he warns, he said, guys, 
you, you've gotten basically lackadaisical in your thinking. You've lost your first love. You're neither hot nor cold. You've got to remember you're fighting a war. It's not business as usual in the church. Whether you realize it or not, today as you sit in our pew, and by the way, thank you for being here. I'm so glad. Uh, we're glad to have the Frasers back and the Browns back after self-quarantine. and Welcome back. We'll try to keep you as safe as possible and distance ourselves. But there's a war going on. We've got to realize that there are evil forces all around us, seen and unseen, that want to shut churches down, that want to shut free speech down. I watched a video recently where a historian talked about the founding fathers and as they signed that beautiful declaration of, of independence, it talked about their religious backgrounds and their faith and how they had been motivated, inspired by preachers in the new country. And what amazes me is how far as a nation we've come in our school systems in modifying history and deleting the truth about our dependence on God in those very early years. You see, prayer is not allowed in schools anymore. We can't talk about Jesus anymore. Who says we can't? Who says we can't? There's a war going on. Turn to Psalm 11 if you have your Bible. I'll give you just a minute to turn there. As I was in my daily reading, I came across this and wanted to share it with each of you. In Psalm 11, we're beginning in verse 1. And I thought this was interesting. It says, uh, In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, Flee like a bird to your mountain? In other words, just leave, get away, go, go to a safe place, high up on the mountain. For behold, verse 2, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Does that sound like a battle going on to you? I'm a good person. I love the Lord. I'm out there loving my neighbor, doing kind deeds. But yet there's an enemy who's trying to pierce my heart. They're trying to kill me and destroy me. Is God going to win this battle? The writer asks. What can we do, Lord? And then in verse 4, you see this, the thought shifting a little bit in this battle between good and evil. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see. His eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous. But his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Now listen to verse 6. This, this transitions now to a punishment of those who are evil and against God. Let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous and he loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. Oh, is that not revelation right there? The battle. People are dying on both sides. Think about Constantine when he legalized Christianity. Yet we see in that first and second century horrific persecution against the early church, people who were willing to die for the cause of Christ. They knew there was a battle going on. There was no question. Loved ones were being dragged off, arrested, tortured, and killed. And so in the psalm, it mentions that these wicked are trying to shoot the dark at the upright in heart. And then, and then we hear the punishment, raining coals, fire and sulfur is mentioned, scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. In other words, it's a cup they have to drink. The Lord's wrath. To me, it sounds like Sodom and Gomorrah. Think about it. God's wrath against the evil. You see, we forget, brethren, that in the very beginning, probably before the first man was created, there was a rebellion in heaven. Pride convinced others to rebel against God, and they were cast down. Satan, unfortunately, was given some free domain on the earth, a certain amount of power, a very powerful being, beautiful entity. We see Satan's influence on mankind in the garden, Genesis 3. 
we see the ultimate consequence of sin on the earth. Genesis 6, the wickedness was so perverse. Satan had done such an effective job at leading men astray that God destroyed that which had breath. Noah and his family was saved through the faith in building the ark. If you don't think Satan is a powerful influence today, think about Job. Ask Job if Satan has power. There are demons. There are spiritual forces that we cannot see. Ephesians 6, verse 11. Up in heaven, on this earth, there are demons that we fight. In Ephesians 6, 11, we're told that we need to be prepared and wear the Christian armor so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, against those spiritual forces seen and unseen. The movie, again, God's Not Dead, and the subsequent movies that followed remind me that we are at war and yet we're promised the victory. Revelation is all about a war and we're victorious in the end. So I want to talk for just a few moments today about victory. In the song, Victory in Jesus, it says that he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. You know, what I, I like about this word, he sought me, is that God initiated that relationship with man. Way back in the Old Testament in the times of Moses, when that law was established, God said, I want you, the Levites, to be in charge of those animal sacrifices. And think for a moment, what was poured out as an atonement for sin? It was blood, wasn't it? The blood of bulls, the blood of goats. As a matter of fact, to be a priest back in those times of Moses in temple worship was kind of like being a butcher. I mean, they were literally covered in blood. They would slaughter animals all day long and be covered in the blood, blood sprinkled on the, on the altar, blood everywhere. You see, in the blood there is life. You take the blood away from a person and there is no life. It is the life. And it is through the blood of those animals that those sins had been atoned for. By faith, God said, I'm willing, instead of killing you for your sins, your transgressions, I'll accept the blood of those bulls and goats. It was a substitution allowed in those days. Later, we're specifically told that there was the blood of the lamb. And you may recall that in those plagues, we see the blood of the lamb over the doorpost and the death angel passed over when the when he saw the blood of the lamb you see it is through the blood of the lamb that there is life not death i'd like you to turn to hebrews for just a moment we're going to talk about the blood jesus seeking us out and paying that sin price not through our own blood our death as we deserve yet he paid it through the blood of his own son hebrews turn to hebrews chapter 9 if you got your bible Give you just a moment to get there. Hebrews 9, we're going to begin in verse 13. This particular chapter talks about, uh, beginning in the second part of the chapter, the redemption through the blood of Christ. Hebrews 9, 13. Listen carefully. For if the blood of goats and bulls, this is referring to the times of Moses and, and the worship in the tabernacle, if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the procure purification of the flesh how much more the writer asked will the blood of christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to god purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living god let's drop down to verse 28 same chapter so christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many will appear a second time you know when that is? Think about it. When will Jesus appear the second time? It's when he's returning, when the trumpet sounds, right? We're told that he's coming. He's having a flashing sword. That sword's coming from his mouth. That's the word of God. He's coming in a, in a wrathful mode, in a vengeance mode. Why? That will be the ultimate defeat depicted in Revelation. When he comes to claim his children, to take them home. How victorious. That's when we, brothers and sisters, want to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. But until that time, 
God has asked us to fight the battle, to be ever vigilant in sharing the good news of Jesus, who loved us so much. God sent his own son to die for us, for my sin. And I appreciate so much in the movie God's Not Dead, a young man you may recall at the beginning who was challenged by a a philosophy professor. At the beginning of the class, he wanted everyone to write, God is dead. God is dead. This young man said, I can't do it, won't do it. And so he explained the rule. Well, if you choose not to do this in my class, we're we're going to let you present your faith. And so he did, very effectively, three different periods. He had an opportunity to witness and stand up before the class and tell them why he believed in God. As the story continues, the professor became quite angry and agitated, and we learn something very traumatic had happened to this professor when he was 12 years old. And he was angry at God. He hated God. God, if you love me, why would you let this happen? I am telling you bad things happen to good people on this earth, but God loves me and God loves you. How do we know that without a doubt? He died for me. He gave his own son and shed his blood for me. He sought me. He sought me out. He bought me. He redeemed me. He purchased me from sin and took me into his embrace. How did he do it? Through his redeeming blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice. Verse 28, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Oh, brothers and sisters, there's victory in Jesus. You see, I stand in the grace of Jesus and his forgiveness, not based on my goodness, not that I've earned his salvation, but that he has covered me in his blood the blood of his own son, the perfect lamb of God. Jesus is saying to us, if my death for you and my redemption is good news, will you share it? Will you tell someone out there who's not a Christian what I've done for them? I need a little good news right now in 2020. How about a wonderful love story? The redemption and love of Jesus and how his blood has washed my sin away. I am not will be. I am victorious now. No matter what happens to me, I know where my home is. I know that Jesus loves me. He loved me even before I knew who he was. You see, this is a love story that began, I believe, before the first man was even created. God, knowing that mankind would fall, set this plan in place. Turn to Romans chapter 5 if you have your Bible open. Romans chapter 5. Great chapter to read. We're going to be reading verses 6 and 8. Paul reminds us in Romans, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. One will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He initiated that love relationship. He made the plan to die for us. It was a predestined plan before man even was on the earth. And that's why the writer says he loved me. That little funny E-R-E, air, is short for before. He loved me ere I knew him. Before I even knew who God was, he had already enacted the plan in place and decided to offer Jesus Christ, that precious Lamb of God, to die for me, a substitutionary payment of my sin, one which God accepted because he was a perfect and pure offering. Finally, he says, he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. That's a little hard concept for us to understand. He plunged me for vic- to victory beneath the cleansing flood of what? Go back to the original Jewish tradition of ceremonial washing. It happened a lot. Jews washed a lot before they ate. They did ceremonial washing to worship. Remember, even the Pharisees accused Jesus and his apostles of being unclean because they didn't wash 
before eating, remember? They didn't wash their hands. It was ceremonial cleansing. This goes way back into the times of Moses. But as ceremonial cleansing was burned into the minds of each Jew, we see John the Baptist now preparing the way for Jesus Christ the Messiah. He's baptizing in the wilderness, right? A baptism of repentance. Jesus comes along and, and John the Baptist baptizes him as well. John said, I'm really not worthy. And so as Jesus went down in the water as an example to us, not because he was sinful, but because he wanted to obey the Father in all things, he was obedient. He subjected himself to water baptism. As we see Jesus die and raise again, we have the apostles beginning to preach the good news, which is now called the gospel. The gospel is the death and the burial and the resurrection, the same gospel that we preach today. And the idea of being plunged into victory beneath the cleansing flood simply represents our contact, listen, this is important, our contact with the blood of of Jesus. We reach the blood of Jesus by faith and by obedience and command. Acts 2.38, Mark 16.15.16. 16, 16. You can go on and look at scriptures. We subject ourselves to water baptism and by faith we go under that water, a burial in the blood of Jesus. So by faith we reach the blood of Jesus. That's why as, as ministers of the gospel, those who are out teaching and preaching, we can't just share what Jesus did. We now have to tell them, according to the scriptures, how you receive cleansing. Acts 22, verse 16, Paul retells what he was instructed when he became a Christian. Paul, in retelling the story, says, and now why do you wait? Rise. Some translations say, arise. Be baptized and wash away your sins calling on his name. You see, the water in the case of baptism represents the blood of Jesus. It's just normal water that comes out of a faucet. You and I know that. There's nothing magical about the water in the baptistry. But by faith, we understand it is the blood of Jesus and it symbolizes being buried in the blood. And by faith, when we submit to water baptism, our sins are washed away. Acts 22, verse 16. The last graphic that we have today is simply the gospel that's reenacted in baptism. This is taken from Romans chapter 6. And you're welcome to read this and study this. And please, by all means, if you're watching this live stream or through YouTube, contact us. Send us a message. Put a message on our church website. We would be honored to study with you more about how to receive salvation according to the Bible by confessing that Jesus is the Christ, repenting of that old lifestyle, being buried in the waters of baptism, being raised up now a new faithful child of God who lives and is a member of a congregation of the Lord's church, wherever that may be. Simply, Romans 6 reminds us that we must die to self, symbolic of the death on the cross. We're buried in a tomb of water, and that water represents the blood of Jesus, cleansing us from our sin. We rise up now, a new child of God. We've been purified, we've been cleansed, we're washed and made holy. We're now sin-free and given the commission to tell others the good news of Jesus. There is victory in Jesus. Oh, brothers and sisters, if today Satan has somehow robbed you of your joy, that you're a child of God, I'm sorry. I want you to repent of that. If you're lethargic, apathetic, maybe you just feel like you don't need to share the gospel with somebody, that's not your job, go back and re-examine the scriptures carefully. All of us who are children of God need to tell others what Jesus has done for us after all, he's asking us to share the good news. The good news of victory in Jesus. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't let Satan plant fear in your heart. Just tell somebody. Tell somebody who's not a Christian how to be saved. Share the good news, the victory in Jesus. The lesson is yours today. I'm going to ask Brian to lead us in an invitation song. If you need to respond, if you're not a Christian, and maybe you're listening through live stream or YouTube, 
contact us and let us know how to help you become a Christian. It's an easy process. We'll teach you the biblical way to become a child of God by reaching that precious blood of Jesus. You'll be victorious. You'll know that your sins have been cleansed. You're now a child of God. Let's stand and sing together. appreciate each of you for being here, whether in person or by live stream. I'd like to invite each of you to be back tonight at 6 o'clock for evening worship. Our young men will be conducting our service tonight. Okay. Our young men uh, need to meet with Brother Tom immediately following service this morning. Any other final announcements? Not our closing song will be I stand in awe of you. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard, who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depths of your love? You are beautiful beyond description, majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand. To marvelous for words, to wonderful for comprehension.
creation like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depths of your love? You are beautiful beyond description. Majesty enthroned above, and I stand, I stand in all of you. I stand, I stand in all of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand. stand, I stand in all of you. I stand, I stand in all of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in Heavenly Father, we thank you for such a beautiful day that you've given us to come out and worship. And Heavenly Father, we just ask that you help us to remember that there's victory in you and in your son's blood. And we just ask that as we leave here today that you help us to look around us, to look at those around us, and to share your word as much as we can in the victory that we have in you. Heavenly Father, we just ask that as we go through this crisis that you help us to remember who's in charge and that you're always in charge and that there is a much greater life than the one here on earth and that's a home in heaven with you heavenly father we just ask that you protect us and be with us as we leave this place uh, and in the end give us a home in heaven with you it's in jesus name that we pray amen <laughs>